Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the second Bark Buds and Branches event. Um, so popular, we're doing it twice. So it's really exciting to have um, all of you here who are interested. Um, thanks for being here today. Well, I should introduce myself first. I'm Catherine. I do AmeriCorps with the Vermont Land Trust. And I've been helping a lot with the events team to help support our virtual events that we've been offering. And that's been a really fun, interesting addition to my service. Um, today we have the VLT forestry team, all of the coolest people at VLT, in my opinion. Um, Peter Van Loon, Dan Kilborn, David McMath, and Caitlin Cusack, they're all going to show you the trees that they think are super cool and um, tell you how to identify them in winter, which can sometimes be a head scratching time to identify trees, but they have some really great photos and some really great information to share with us today. So um, make yourself comfortable. I guess I'll start with a few Zoom tips. So just so everyone who's tuning in knows, we can't see your screen or your, or sorry, your, your face or your voice. So you can relax completely at home and just tune in. Um, if you want to add a comment, you can do that by clicking on the chat function, which many of you have already found and type your comment in and um, that will be shared with everyone. And then if you wanna ask a question to our lovely foresters, we ask that you put it in the Q and A um, function, which is at, also at the bottom of your screen on the right um, hand side. And that is just a way that helps us keep track of the questions a little bit more easily so we can remember uh, what has and has not been answered. So try to put your questions in there and we will try to get to as many as we can. And um, a recording will be available after the event. So if you wanna share it or watch it again, you can do that. And also you can check your email after the event also and you will find a survey and more follow-up resources in case you just did not get enough from the webinar and you wanna keep learning. So did I miss anything? Foresters that I should add? No? Are okay, you, then we'll, hey, Catherine, are, yes. you re, are you recording? Because I don't see a little recording button. Yes, on. we are recording. Okay, great. Now, <laughs> yeah. So this will be available um, on our YouTube channel when it'll probably up, up, be up by tomorrow or the day after. Um, so yeah, thanks for letting me do the housekeeping. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Peter. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm Peter Van Loan, and uh, as Catherine said, I'm joined by the rest of the BLT Forestry team: Dan Kilborn, Caitlin Cusack, and David McMath. And thanks for thanks for being here. Welcome to our Winter Tree ID presentation. Um, about 15 years ago, I was uh, in the Pacific Northwest, walking around in the woods out there with a bunch of foresters, and just amazed by the scale of the trees out there. One of the foresters leaned into me and she said, oh, I just can't wait to get east to see your forest. And I thought, what is she talking about? And so I, I said to her, what do you mean? Look at these trees. We have nothing that compare, can compare to this. And she said, oh, yes, you do. Your trees, you have so many different kinds of trees. Your forests are so diverse. And she's right. And that's one of the things that we're sort of bumping up against. And one of the things we're having to uh sort of work with today and and so how we're going to do it is we're each going to present on three or four different species common hardwood species in vermont <clears throat> and if we don't happen to get to your tree the one that you wanted to know about please type something into the q a we'll try to get to it at the end if we don't get to all the questions at the end we will respond in a follow-up email or a blog post or something like that and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to get us started with some of the basics. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks, folks, for joining us today. Nice to be with you. I'm Dan Kilborn. I'm a forester, BLT forester working in the northeast part of the state, calling in today from Island Pond. We wanted to kick today off with just some uh, beginning winter tree ID basics that we hope will be helpful as we talk through um, the, the tips we have for you today. So let's start with the twig. Um, if you take a live branch from a tree, uh, it'll have buds along the sides and then one at the very tip. 
These buds are where next year's leaves will emerge for growth in the spring. The bud on the end is called the terminal bud because that, it's at the terminus of the twig, and the buds along the sides are called the lateral buds. Buds are made up of individual leaf scales, or bud scales rather. And beneath all the buds, there will be a leaf scar, which is the mark that was left when the leaf was attached before it fell off in the fall. And within the scar, you can find, uh, within the leaf scar, you can find a bundle scar, which is where the broken ends of vascular bundles that pass through the stem into the leaves were found. These can look like small dots or discolorations or raised bumps. Um, another important feature of winter tree ID um, is the branching pattern. So buds and leaves are arranged around the branches in a certain pattern. They're either opposite or alternate. Um, so on that drawing in the upper right of the screen, you can see that opposite just means they're located directly across from one another. Alternate means that they alternate along the twig. So this does not change between species. Uh, a species is either opposite or alternate. And a trick to remember uh, which trees are opposite is the mnemonic MADCAP horse, where MAD stands for maple, ashes, and dogwoods. CAP sta stands for the Caprifoliaceae family, which is mostly shrubs and vines. And horse stands for horse chestnut trees. We'll be focused today on, on uh, maples and ashes. And bark. So lastly, we'll talk well, just a few quick thoughts about bark. It has many different characteristics. Um, this is certainly true that there's differences between species. So, so bark might be smooth or it might have visible lenticels, which are just little pockets for, that are used for gas exchange, or they might have vertical ridges or fissures, or it might be peely or flaky or platy or rough. I mean, you get the idea here. Um, there's also differences in bark between young trees and mature trees of the same species. Bark just changes over time as the trees grow. And there can be uh, some real variability in bark even between species. So you can have a tree that's the same species and the same age, and they still look different. Um, and this is because bark appearance can be heavily influenced by the tree's vigor, essentially how happy it is and how well it's growing. So with that, we want to acknowledge that there can be some head scratchers. Um, when we get stumped, I had a college professor named Doc Donnelly who would say, hey, that's life. But today we have some great tips and hopefully some good tricks that'll make things a little easier. So if you'll advance uh, the slide, Peter, we'll talk about ash. So again, uh, I'm Dan. I work in the Northeast part of the state, Essex, Caledonia, Orleans counties. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing some information about ash today. So if I want, I want to start by um, sharing some of the reasons I, I care about ash, and I think it's um, a species that I uh, would talk to you about. If we start on that, that tree photo on the left, there's just the beauty of it, right? It's tall, it's straight, it's a commanding tree in the forest. White ash can be 80 feet tall, and I've seen them over 30 inches across at breast height, so they can get quite large. Um, we make lots of things out of ash. It's great for firewood, pulpwood, um, furniture, tool handles, baseball bats. Uh, but it's interesting in preparing for the talk today, I realized that for a forest product, ash is really outsized in representation in the recreation that I do. You can see my, my snowshoes, which are made out of ash in the upper right photo poised up against um, a female white ash in an ash regeneration harvest. Um, my pack basket is made from ash. You can see that uh, sitting in the canoe um, in the bottom center photo uh, made from brown ash. Um, and when I found this photo, it was interesting to me. I also noticed that the gunnels, the long uh, wooden top along the sides of the canoe and the thwarts, the, um, the wooden cross piece are also made from ash as well as the paddle that my daughter's holding. And lastly, it's important to mention that uh, ash is extremely important to, to Native Americans, both for the basket making, um, for pack baskets, utility baskets, uh, decorative baskets, um, but also because many tribes uh, track their origin story back to ash, well, with their people actually emerging from this tree. So if you, you can go ahead, Peter, we'll look at some range maps. Today, we're gonna to talk about our three native species of ash in Vermont. 
white ash, which is also called Biltmore ash, green ash, also sometimes called red ash, uh, and black ash, known sometimes called brown or basket ash. And interestingly, uh, both green and black are also called water and swamp ash for reasons I think you'll see in a few minutes. So when you look at the range maps, you can see that they're all uh, widely distributed across Eastern North America with black ash being the most northerly adapted. We can go ahead and look at the distribution in Vermont specifically. White ash, man, look at that map on the left. There's just so much of it, it's even hard to see the map. Um, it's our most common ash in Vermont. Uh, we find it as a typical component of our Northern hardwood forest, uh, often there, but it rarely dominates. We especially find it in areas where the soil is a bit richer. It might be uh, moist and moderately well-drained. So this is an upland tree often found on moist side slopes or cove areas. Green ash in the center is less well distributed. Uh, this is because of the site conditions where it grows. It might prefer the same sites as white ash, but it's very adaptable and it can compete better on either really dry soils or places where it's frequently flooded. So we find our heaviest concentra concentrations of green ash in the Champlain Valley, particularly in the wetlands and floodplains in the islands, in the Champlain Islands. Um, and because of this adaptability and because of its uh, salt tolerance, it's also commonly planted. So you might be finding green ash in cities and towns. Black ash, similar to green ash, is restricted by site. It's pretty well distributed through the state, but you really only find it in those poorly drained CP areas. It's common on peat and muck soils and wetlands. Let's get into some ID stuff with the buds. So how do we recognize this tree without its leaf? Let's start with the branching structure. If we, re if we remember the uh, madcap horse, mad stands for maple ash dogwood, ashes are opposite. The photo on the right shows those really stout opposite branches. Um, it has a large leaf scar, which can uh, easily be seen on the twig and you notice those are also opposite. If you look at the shape of that leaf scar on the white ash, you'll see a U shape where it wraps up around that lateral side bud. So it really looks like a smiling, uh, happy twig as a white ash tree. In comparison, you'll see uh, a sideways D that uh, lies flat against that lateral bud with the backside of the D on both the green and the black ash. There is some variability here, but remember that's life. Uh, you'll also want to use sight as a helpful indicator. So if you have dry feet and you're in an upland, you might be looking at white ash. If you have wet feet and you're down in a bottomland, you might be trying to determine the difference between green or black. And you'll see that black has that really dark terminal bud, almost like a chocolate chip or a Hershey's Kiss where the others are more uh, buff, lighter brown. You'll also note that the black ash terminal bud sits up on a little stalk. So it's separated from the lateral buds, unlike white or green, which are tucked right close together, um, and bark. So all three of these species start out pretty bland when they're young. You can see a picture of a young ash bark on the right. Green might have a slightly rougher look at this stage, but when white and green get uh, mature, boy, it can be tough. They both have ridges and fissures that tend to take on diamond shapes. Um, I feel like green might have a more finely laced pattern sometimes, but again, this, this depends a lot on site and uh, the vigor of the tree and how well it's growing. There sometimes uh, can be noticeable differences between um, the upper branches in white and green with, the, with white ash having a smoother bark on those upper branches and green having a more flaky bark. Again, check your feet, think about site where these trees are found. Um, whether you're in an upland for the white ash or perhaps in a lowland for the green ash. Black ash bark is much different. It's, uh, it's flaky, it's quirky, it's often spongy to the touch. Uh, you can see how it can form these uh, thick, like pushy ridges. Boy, if you find one like that and you can wrap your hand around it and give it a squeeze, it just might be my favorite tree bark in the woods. Um, and the last thing we wanna mention about ash is that we're in a time of change. And if Peter, you could go to the last slide. Um, this is a really important time to care about ash. All of our ash are gonna be dramatically impacted by emerald ash borer, a, a non-native invasive insect that's now uh, starting to pop up in many parts of the state. Because of this, you're gonna find ash bark looking different in some places very soon. 
Uh, woodpeckers will cause what's called blonding. Well, they'll flake away those upper ridges uh, of the bark looking for the emerald ash borer larvae underneath. Um, so it creates this uh, really light looking color. Uh, it can be very, very noticeable in a heavy infested tree. So to go into much more detail is really beyond the scope of our time today. We could spend a whole hour just talking about this. Uh, and in fact, if you're interested, there, there is a VLT webinar on monitoring for EAB and strategies for managing ash uh, archived on our YouTube site. Uh, we'll include a, if you're interested to look at that, we'll include a note um, in our follow-up email uh, list of resources. So things are gonna change for ash. That last photo on the right might look like sun setting on ash in Vermont. But there is hope. We want to leave you with that. Um, we are finding out more about resistance and white ash. Uh, we're learning more about management strategies that we can use to hopefully keep ash in our landscape long term. And I happen to know that this photo was taken at sunrise. So I choose to look at it as a new day coming for our, for our ash, new but different. So with that, maybe I'll take a few questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we don't have any specific questions about ash, but maybe you could, um, since you did some intro to tree ID, maybe you could answer a couple of questions generally about ID. Um, and so one is one one uh, participant pointed out that um, there are there are you know sub opposite and and world branching patterns. So maybe you could just sort of address that briefly for folks so they know you know maybe it's not the species we're talking about today, but um, there's other out there. Yeah, great point. So whorls occur um, uh, often on soft lizards, especially pines. Um, so they'll actually, um, instead of uh, branching in uh, like a two plane direction along the, along the tree on the main stem, they'll, they'll shoot out like a, a circular whorl. Uh, and if you have a tree like that, like a pine, you can actually count the age of it by counting up the whorls on the tree, which is a, which is a nice feature. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Um, and we do actually have a question that came in um, about ash, and I'll tie these together since they're both EAB related. What is the source, or I'm assuming is where, where does EAB come from? How did it get here? And then what it, uh, did you say that blonding occurs only on white ash? Yeah, good question. So EAB uh, comes from uh, Asia, from, from China, where it's a natural uh, insect in their woods, and their ashes are actually uh, adapted to to, to deal with that insect and it's not a problem. We believe it came over to the United States in packing material, uh, perhaps pallets, in um, the early 2000s, late 90s uh, in, in Michigan uh, and has really been expanding away around the United States from there. Um, and no, blonding does not only occur in white ash, uh, it, it's often found there, but when, uh, when those insect populations explode, and we have uh, heavy larvae uh, uh, populations under the bark, the insect, the woodpeckers are going to be going after all of it. So we'll see blonding across the species. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll keep moving on, everyone. The questions are starting to pour in, and we will get to them one way or another. Um, I did just want to add this one interesting comment that um, uh, someone who I'm assuming is over in New Hampshire said they used to make lobster traps from ash in Plainfield, New Hampshire. So just oh. fun, another fun ash fact. I love it. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to be going next. Um, I'm David. You can see I kind of do sort of the western part of the state up through the middle, central to western um, here at VLT. Um, anyway, thanks, Dan. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to talk about a group of hardwood trees that has very significant to wildlife in our area. That'd be white oak, red oak, hop beam, and American beech. Um, just real quick, uh, Oaks have been really special to me over the years, and um, we currently have a very large red oak that has been watching over my family in our schoolhouse for the last 140 years, and that's the tree sort of on the right there. Um, go ahead, Peter. The, um, <clears throat> before I get into the oaks, I sort of the range and stuff, Vermont has um, 11 native species. You might find more because it's a popular landscape tree. Um, because oaks can get so many different um, species and everything and they'll crossbreed, it can be really, really tough to, to figure them out. So a lot of times we just get it into the 
white or red oak family. And if you can find a leaf, it's really easy. So red have points, white have rounded lobes on the end of their leaves. Um, so pretty easy. Um, and the leaves do stick around a little bit. So sometimes you can actually dig down in the snow and find them. Um, but anyway, getting to the ranges of um, the two, you can see red oaks just a little more winter hardy, a little farther north than the white. Um, I haven't found red oak in the colder areas in Vermont. Um, but it does show the range there. And you can see in the white oak, it definitely doesn't get up, um, at least up in the north northern areas very much. Okay, next slide. So looking at um, the red oak, and again, all this stuff, I'm gonna be kind of looking at just sort of, you know, you're walking through the forest and don't have your, your field book with you or something like that. So, with the red oak, the, the bark tends to be dark. Um, it can be dark gray to black. I find up this way, they often on the older trees, there's a lichen, a really uh, tight lichen that covers the trees and makes that bark sort of model looking. Um, it's best described as shallow, tight furrows separating wide, scaly ridges. Um, I was, a lot of times on the older trees, the bark is more rough on the, on the, the base. And as you go up, the bark sort of becomes um, smoother, almost shiny, and it has these little, people described them as um, little ski trails, these ridges between the bark plates. Uh, pretty unique once, uh, once you start seeing that. The other thing with these, um, with the oak trees, actually all four of the trees I'm gonna talk about, they, their leaves tend to persist well into winter on the tree. So I've many times on the oaks, you can find a leaf still on there. You can pull it off and unroll it and you can at least tell if it's in the white or the red family. Um, the other thing with oaks, um, I mean, these are, you know, just incredible amount of stories and folklore around them. I mean, these are a real dominant tree. So keep that in mind when you're out in the woods, they can become very, um, very noticeable for that reason. Uh, next one. So looking at the white oak, the bark on this tends to be a little more light colored. So that'd be sort of a gray to a whitish gray. Um, the, the bark can be both shallow and deeply furrowed and forming scaly ridges or plates that can be overlapping. The older trees, these actually start curling off, great habitat for bats and that kind of thing. Um, again, look for that persistent leaf. Um, Again, they can become prominent tree out there. And I notice on the branching pattern, if you start comparing it to other trees, it's more gnarly. They're um, not these nice, straight, graceful lines, but they'll go out more horizontal and they'll be really, um, like I said, gnarly. Um, the other thing I find with white oak is it can be a solitary tree. You can be going along and all of a sudden you'll just see one white oak and it'll be quite a while before you'll see another one. So keep that in mind. All right, so we're banging through those. Let's go to the next to, next slide. So looking at um, beach, American beach and hop hornbeam, again, very similar range. The beach is probably a little bit farther. I found it interesting. Hop hornbeam is found down in South America. Um, so next slide. So looking at the the beach, I think the beach is one of the more um, straightforward trees that you can um, find out in the woods that smooth pale gray bark is really unmistakable. Uh, because these are a popular wildlife tree, the bears will climb them. So often you'll see the claw marks on that bark. And then if you look up, sometimes you'll see what almost looks like a, a big bird's nest or a broken top or some sort. So the bear will climb the beach, find a place to, to get settled, and they'll reach out and grab in these finer branches with the beech nuts on them. And then they'll tuck that those branches um, in around them, and it kind of creates this. So it looks like a nest. Um, the other big thing on the beach is if you look at the bud in the left-hand corner, it's um, really distinct bud. And if you catch um, the sun catches it just right, especially later before they um, burst, it will even get bigger and real orangey, and you can't miss that. Um, the one thing with beach is that it does get the beach bark disease. It's been really devastated a lot of the population. Um, so this is a two-part 
phenomenon. So it's a, a non-native scale insect that got introduced, latches onto that bark, drills a hole in it, makes the wound, it kind of this rage, raised ridges, pot marks, chicken pox, what have you. Um, and then it's actually a fungus that comes in after it, the pathogen that actually kills the tree. Um, so I think you, you can see them rougher looking like that, but you can still, still see that um, color and that smooth bark is still a dead giveaway. Okay, the last one, um, go ahead, Peter, is the hop horn beam. This one gets confused um, with another tree, but it's got lots of names. Um, Eastern hop horn beam, American hop horn beam, woolly hop horn beam, Eastern ironwood, rough bark ironwood, deer wood, hard hack, lever wood, and I learned it as the axe handle wood. It's very hard. Um, it's not really a commercial species though. It doesn't get really big enough. Um, it's actually, you know, popular for firewood and that kind of stuff. It's in the birch family. Um, I find the birch buds pretty difficult to key out. So with this one, like the beach, um, the bark is really the big giveaway and you really don't need to be keying buds out. So the bark is is a uh, thin gray bark furrows, forms this narrow plate like um, you know loose scales, and then they'll start peeling up. Up our way, it's not a big tree, you know, four to eight inch diameter usually. But as you do get in southern Vermont, it becomes bigger, um, and and really considered a weed tree down there. Um, the let's see, again, not a real tall tree, big tree. The other thing on this one is in right in the middle, you'll see that picture of the catkin. It's kind of a three pronged thing. looks like a goose foot. And anytime you get under a tree, you can see those usually very easily. And it's another dead giveaway with the bark. And obviously if in the fall, if you can later fall, you can pick up the, the hop lake sea cluster, which is really, really pretty neat. So the tree that gets confused with this a lot is worth mentioning is the Carpinius Carolina, which is the, uh, most people call it um, blue beech, but it's it's the hornbeam. It's actually American hornbeam without the hop. Um, also very hard tree, um, but it's very, the bark's completely different. On the hornbeam, also called muscle wood, it looks like the muscle in your arm. It's smooth, more like a beech tree. Um, and again, like the hop hornbeam has that shaggy bark. So, but these names get, get inter, intermixed all the time. Okay, looking real quick at the buds, you can see that again, that beach, very distinct. Um, the rokes, I think of the white as being a little more blunt than the red, uh, but that's not always the case. And the hop horn beam, again, I usually don't bother trying to key that out, but you'll see a delicate branches with little um, bulby buds on it. And last slide, let's see, yeah, one more. Um, just looking at the acorns and stuff. So the beech seed nuts are really cool little nut. If you're lucky in the fall, actually, most of the time you find the husk and the seeds already gone, but you can try either edible. Hop horn beam obviously looks like the hop. And then one other thing on the red and white oak. Um, if you notice in the white oak, that cap is almost going around the acorn, more cup-like, and where the red oak is more plate or saucer-like, another good way to tell the difference between those two. And last slide, and let's see, might have a time for one question. And again, you can see the difference there um, on those. Any questions real quick, then we gotta move on. Yeah, okay. So David, I have a lot of questions. So we'll oh, we'll great. just pick a couple. <laughs> no, they're all great. Um, so a question and sort of interesting. Do you see white oaks moving into northern Vermont? And you know, I guess to add on to what could we expect in the future? I mean, uh, I think with climate change, any slight warming, we'll certainly see that range extend up. Um, I don't really know. I know they're pretty susceptible to to the cold, so I'm not sure up in the in the colder parts if it will be there. But it's up Champlain Valley, Connecticut River Valley. I think there's a few up in Newport, um, so it's certainly around. Great. Um, and then I'll let's see the other one. Um, why 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 are 
why is it that white oaks are solitary? I think the acorns would be sprouting nearby. That was Richard's question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I That's just there was a personal observation on that. I knew to, uh, the acorns on the white oak do mature in one year. So the squirrels are usually not, um, you know, they're if they're grabbing those, they're eating them right away versus a red where they get stored for a year and have to go through that um, cold period to, to sprout. So maybe that's that's some of it. Um, and I'm not, I can't think of the regeneration requirements for oak right this minute either. So could be some of that. Okay, great. Thanks, David. So I think we'll keep moving, um, but hopefully we'll come back to um, a lot of these great questions. Hey, thanks. Hi again, everybody. Again, I'm Peter Van Loan. Uh, I cover the southern four counties for VLT. <clears throat> so that's sort of yellow birch colored area at the bottom of the map. And besides being a tree geek, I'm also a bird nerd. And if you love birds, you should love birch trees. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, one is the seeds. Uh, so they make a lot of seed. And it's usually released in the coldest winter months um, so things that are feeding on the ground, like rough grouse and turkey and junco and that sort of thing, uh, get a little bit of food, an easy meal when there's snow on the ground already. Um, another thing is uh, the catkins, the male catkins and the female catkins are on the tree in the wintertime. The male catkins are a critical resource for rough grouse. Uh, and the female catkins with the little tiny seeds in them, things like goldfinches and pine siskins will feed on those. And so one thing we know about uh, paper birch especially is that it rots really easily, right? And so that makes it a great candidate for, for cavity nesters like woodpeckers and chickadees and nuthatches to build their, their little nest holes in. And the last thing I'll say about this is the, the bark structure of the paper birch and even more so the yellow birch is such that there are a lot of insects and spiders and things hiding in all those nooks and crannies. And so birds that um, feed by gleaning along the bowl of the tree like a brown creeper or a nuthatch or even woodpeckers uh, will get a lot of food feeding on yellow birches. So. Here's where you'll find them in Vermont. I didn't include gray birch. It has pretty much the same distribution as yellow birch and paper birch. Uh, they're pretty much everywhere. The paper birch and the gray birch, uh, those need a little bit more light, especially early on. Uh, the gray birch especially is an early successional tree, so you'll find that in openings along roadsides, um, places where there's a lot of light. The one that you see that's really different here is the black birch, and that's much more of a southern species. It's at the northern extent of its range here, so it's found in the warmer places like the, the valleys, the uh, Connecticut River Valley, the Bennington Valley up into the, um, the Meadowy and the southern Champlain Valley. And I think that's another one that's going to be a climate change winner. Uh, that's going to expand its range north as things warm. A thing, another thing that's helping it is that deer don't really like it. So it's really successful at regenerating. So a couple of weeks ago, I ran across this picture on Instagram. It's by a local photographer named Brenda Petrella. And uh, if you like nature photographer, photography, check her out. Um, this sort of gets at a couple of things. One that uh, uh, David mentioned about oaks and the, the original comment uh, came from Dan. And that was, this is really hard. It can get confusing, especially because birches hybridize so i'm not sure if this is a picture of a yellow birch on the left and a paper birch on the right and a hybrid in the middle but it sure looks like that and it's just a reminder that things can get kind of confusing out there but let's start with some of the easy stuff um, which is the mature bark so with yellow birch the name sort of says it all right if you see yellow anywhere yellow or gold on that bark then it's a yellow birch it has the very thin strips of bark that sort of curl as they peel back you might see a little bit of white like on the picture uh, on the upper right of the yellow birch photos it says a little bit of white kind of looks like paper birch but that golden color tells you that it's yellow birch 
The one on the bottom right <clears throat> is an older uh, yellow birch. And when they get old, they get sort of a, a much different uh, bark structure. It's much platier, more like the black birch just to the right of it. The difference is the color is lighter. Again, you have sort of a yellowish tinge to it. Um, so that'll help you differentiate between the two. Looking at the black birch, the thing that it gets uh, gets confused with most often is black, bir uh, black cherry, excuse me. And with black cherry, the plates aren't quite as big and they're certainly not as thick. They'll flake off. You move your hand across a, a black cherry and it'll little pieces of the bark will flake off. You do that on the black birch and you'll just hurt your hand. It's, it's not going to break off. Um, moving on to the next two, paper and gray birch, both so-called white birches. So everybody knows the paper birch, right? It has those nice big wide strips of paper that peel back and reveal the pink or orangey pink uh, inner bark underneath. Gray birch can also be very white, like paper birch. You can see on that picture, uh, the left picture of gray birch, but it typically has sort of a dirty look to the bark, like the picture on the right, especially lower down on the tree. But the dead giveaway is those black triangular patches right where the branches insert into the bowl. If you see those, you know you've got gray birch. So looking at the twigs, I'm going to help David key these out a little bit. So the thing that I look at right away is if you go back from the first year um, growth, you'll see these spurs uh, like on the, under the, um, the bud of the, of the birches. And that's where the leaf from the previous year has, or previous years, uh, had been attached. Whereas every year, the buds on the hop hornbeam are attached right to the twig. So you don't have those, those little spur branches. And the only other trees that have something that look kind of like this are apple trees. And you're not going to generally find those as little saplings out in the woods. So if you see spurs on the twigs, that's birch. No spurs, then it's hop hornbeam. So the other thing that I look at right away is the leaf scars. And you look at this set of leaf scars and it has kind of a funny looking shape and you can see three dots in the middle those are the bundle scars that dan was talking about where the plumbing for the leaf uh, plugs into the twig and when i look at these i see lemur faces and so if you've got a hand lens which i recommend you take out into the woods if you're going to get really geeky about this stuff and look at bud scales and leaf scars, and you look through your hand lens and you see a lemur face staring back up at you, and then uh, you've got a birch. So uh, a few specific things. Yellow birch has hairy, uh, first year anyway, first year growth, so the stuff way out at the tip of the twig has hairy sort of greeny brown bark. Uh, the bottom half of the bud is right up against the twig. Uh, black birch looks very similar and they, as it says here, they both smell and taste of wintergreen, but that bud on the black birch is going to be leaning away from the twig. Uh, twig ID on paper birch, you look at that bud on the paper birch, it looks fairly similar to the one we were just looking at. Uh, for yellow birch, it's also pretty close to the twig, but the difference is that the lenticels are much more raised on the paper birch, and it has sometimes a little bit of a sort of powdery uh, substance, looking substance on the outside. Uh, the gray birch looks kind of similar in terms of raised lenticels. They're even more raised, kind of wart-like, wart um, but the difference is the bud is widest at the middle and then tapers at both ends. So if you see that, that's really distinctive. You know you've got a gray birch as opposed to a paper birch. And if that doesn't work, then I just suggest you step back, look around at what's growing in, the, in terms of mature trees in the woods uh, and look up um, gray birch has single catkins. Um, the other birches have clumps of, or of three or more. Uh, paper birch is generally three. If it's more than that, uh, it's probably a yellow or a black birch. And um, the female catkins look kind of like uh, pine cones. Um, they're a little rounder and shorter 
um, bring your binoculars to look at those. Use them to look at the birds too. So with that, how about some questions, Kaylin? Okay, we've got a, a question from Tall, and this is, I know some folks use white birch bark for crafting, and is it true that one should not remove the bark even if it is starting to flake, but only use bark that has flaked off on its own? That is true. You, it's best to leave it on there. Um, if you strip it off, especially if you strip it off all the way around the tree, the tree is not going to like that. Um, there are companies that will <clears throat> harvest the bark and sell it to folks who build, cr who make crafts. The best way to do that is to, to do it before you do a timber harvest and only do it on those trees that you're going to be removing anyway. Great. Thanks, Peter. And then just a, a note from Bob Hyams. Black birch is, uh, he finds a lot of it in parts of Heinsberg as well. So it gets up here in the Champlain Valley um, pretty well. Um, Thanks, Bob. And yeah, so Trish was wondering, uh, what is the soil preference for black birch? Soil preference for black birch? Um, it's kind of a generalist. Uh, it, it'll grow best on a nice, well-drained loam, um, but it can also, like the other birches, it can do well um, on a drier site. They tend not to be so much on sandy sites, but uh, sort of rocky, bouldery sites. You'll find them growing sometimes as well. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. And just one more before we move on. Okay. Do all birch taste of winter winter green? No, it's just the yellow and the black. So if you break that twig and smell it or taste it and it tastes like winter green, then it's one of those two. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Okay, I think we'll move on and then we'll come back to questions um, at the end. So my name is Caitlin Cusack. I probably should have introduced myself before um, inserting all the questions, but um, I live in Bristol and I cover um, the mid to southern Champlain Valley and then the Mad River Valley. So you'll find me roaming those woods. Um, maples, which I'm going to cover for you, are, are special trees for my husband and I. Uh, what started as a, a 40 bucket hobby has turned into a 750 tap sugaring business, uh, which, you know, as you can imagine, is tiny by, by today's standards, but um, it's still a really uh, fun and an important activity for our family. Um, it's something that we're excited to introduce our daughter, Fiona, who's now two, to. Um, it's a tradition. I also wanted to mention that we have the Abenaki and, and Native Americans to thank. They are the, the first ones to uh, identify the sweet sap um, that comes from sugar maples and were the first ones to actually condense that sap into sugar. And so I hope you'll join us on March 25th when we host uh, Chief Stevens of the Nelhegan Band where he shares that uh, maple sh their maple sugar story. So next slide, Peter. Oops, I think we're frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Drum roll. Uh, okay, so there are six native species of maple that uh, we find in Vermont. Today, I'm going to talk about the two most common ones, sugar maple and red maple. I'll also uh, talk about the non-native one, Norway maple, which... Um, you will also see in Vermont. Um, so as you can see by the uh, larger sort of US range map on the right for red maple, um, it's, it's pretty well distributed throughout the Eastern United States all the way from Nova Scotia down to Florida. Um, it is one of the most common Eastern tree species and that's really because it's, it's more of a generalist and so it can exist and grow on a whole range of sites from swamps to really dry sites and, and sort of everything in, in between. Um, when you look at sugar maple, that tends to be restricted to regions with cool, moist climates like here in Vermont. And then when you look at the, the green maps, um, which are in the middle there, sugar maple on the left, red maple on the right, you can see, especially looking at the sugar maple map, why it's our state tree. And you can hardly see the state's boundaries underneath all the green. Um, and sugar maple in particular, because of our, our bedrock in many places, which tends to be uh, have, have more calcium and uh, thus a higher, P a little slightly higher pH, Sugar maple tends to compete really well on those well-drained, loamy, and, and sweeter soils. And so 
it does well there. When we think of, I know questions have come up about climate change, Red Maple being a generalist and being able to really exist on a range of sites, we may see that increase more in the future um, in Vermont because it's just adapted to um, that wider, wider range and may be able to, to deal with the, the changing climate conditions. Okay, and our next slide is when we look at, when we think of Norway Maple, as in its name, folks may be familiar with that one. It's actually not native to the US. You could see it's native to Europe and um, uh, Western Asia, uh, but it has, it was first introduced in the United States in 1750 for its uh, ornamental value. And since then, it has uh, been planted pretty widely on streets and in people's yards. Crimson King, King is a cultivar. It has these deep red leaves that I know um, folks really uh, value and, and have in their yards. Um, and it's, it's sort of ideal for streets because it's pretty tolerant of harsh conditions like road salt and it doesn't have any native predators. So you don't have to worry about, you know, it developing all these root diseases. And so it just, it's a great street tree in that regard. The only problem is, is it, it can escape the streets <laughs> and head into the woods. And there, because of a lack of native predators, it can um, really take over and it can uh, uh, crowd out sugar maples in particular, but many other native species, um, which is um, of, of concern that we can you know, talk about later. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I thought I would, I would start you know, by looking at the bark. Um, and you know, as Dan had said, this is one of those. This is the this is the M in the MAD. So maples do have opposite branching. Um, so if you can you know identify the branching pattern by looking up, or maybe you have the buds, which I'll cover that in a couple slides. Um, but once you've identified its opposite branching, then you can really take a look at the the bark. And so younger sugar maple trees have almost like a it's like a, a grayish, almost grayish brown in some cases, smooth bark. Um, but there's, there's a pattern that you can see, especially in the picture on the upper left. It's like in between, it's sort, sort of in that smoothness, there is a slight crackled pattern that looks a bit like old paint. And I have Michael Wotek who wrote the book Bark, who I really recommend that book is a good resource. He's the one to describe that. And that's just, I, I found that helpful in being able to uh, look at uh, young sugar maple versus young red maple. Because red maples, when you look at the next slides, you'll see has a pretty smooth bark. And so as the sugar maple tree grows, um, the bark starts to split apart in these vertical, um, in a, in a vertical way. And eventually once you get to the sort of dapper looking tree in the, the bottom right hand corner with the hat and the glasses, those uh, vertical strips start to um, form these, um, these plates. And the plates, uh, which you'll see when we look at red maple, look a little different in red maple. They're not, these plates don't curl. Uh, whereas red maple, when those strips start to form, they, they tend to curl at the ends. The other uh, feature I wanted to uh, share with you all was the damage done by the sugar maple borer. And that's something that you may see commonly when looking at sh sh sugar maples in the woods. And this insect will feed underneath the bark in a mainly horizontal pattern, although it can uh, feed sometimes in a vertical pattern. But you'll, you'll mainly see this horizontal defect um, where the bark has tried to, has started to grow over it. Uh, if the bark has flaked away for some reason, you actually might see the insect gallery. It's the larval stage of this beautiful looking insect that actually causes that damage. And it's specific to sugar maple. So if you're seeing that type of damage on a sugar maple stem, then that um, it can tell you that that's actually a sugar maple that you're looking at. Uh, so next one. So when we compare sugar maple to red maple, um, you see that on the top left, the young red maple really has a pretty silvery uh, gray color to it, um, but it's smooth. It doesn't have that um, kind of crackled uh, old paint pattern to those young stems. And as that uh, tree grows, the smooth bark starts to develop these vertical cracks. Um, and those cracks eventually become these vertical strips. And when you see the tree to the far right, those vertical strips start to flake and even curl at the ends, which is really unlike that sugar maple um, bark we saw. And what's cool is that those strips, you know, when they really form both on the sugar maple and the red maple can be great habitat. Uh, bats can sort of tuck under, up under there and, and find a nice roosting site. 
Um, all right, next one. And then Norway maple. How do we tell the difference between this one? So um, we have a lot of Norways um, in, in Bristol. And so I took a couple pictures. When they're young, you can see the, the bark is smooth and it's starting to form some of those vertical cracks. And it has a bit of an orange tint um, when it's young to, to those cracks. And so you start there, that's sort of moving right as the tree starts to grow. Um, then those, those cracks start to form these ridges and furrows that's very similar to ash um, bark. So what Dan talked about, um, very similar. And those are just gonna deepen as the tree ages. Um, and so you may ask, well, how the heck do I tell a difference then if they're both opposite branched? And, um, and so I think, you know, someone I've, I've kept to find, I'll find it and sort of put it in the chat, but someone gave a great way to describe um, ash uh, branches, but they're stout and they're thicker. Um, and so when you look up into the canopy as that photo on the sort of top right, the ash tree has these very stout um, twigs and branches, and that's uh, very different than uh, a finer uh, maple branching. All right, and then here's, I just put them all next to each other so you can see kind of what, again, red having the smoothest um, bark, especially when it's young sugar, it's got that, you know, old paint, and then Norway having those ridges and furrows, uh, very similar to ash. And then the buds, if you are lucky to have them uh, within uh, reach, then uh, you can see on the far left our sugar maple. Um, the bud scales are, are brown and uh, compared to the red hues of the other, um, the other ones, and it's really pointed. Um, one, I, I know Catherine, you know, likes to remember it by saying it's like a pointed like an ice cream cone. Um, if it works for you, Church steeples are another very iconic Vermont thing. And so the sugar maple bud being an iconic Vermont species is very much like our church steeples. Um, and I, you know, as we're going along, feel free to put other things that help you if others uh, remember these differently, because uh, it's always great to hear those. Um, and then there's, there's some hairs on the edge of those bud scales. Red maple, on the other hand, very red. Uh, rounder buds, not as pointed as sugar maple. Red maples tend to be one of the first species to um, open up their buds in the spring. And for my husband and I, that's we're watching them very carefully because when, when that process starts, the uh, composition of the sap changes and we can get some off flavors. So we're really watching our red maples for that. Um, a question came up last week about the difference between silver and red maple um, buds. And so I put some silver maple picture here and the difference is towards the, as you can see, towards the edge of those bud scales, the color starts to lighten. And there's also hairs on the silver maple versus the red maple that doesn't have that, those hairs and doesn't have that sort of change in color. They both can form bud clusters, so I wouldn't, um, wouldn't go on that, but that would be just a good, good trick for y'all. Um, and then Norway maple, this is a definitely beefier bud than all the rest. Um, and it's maroon and has that sort of blunt, um, blunt tip to it. And with that, I think that is, yeah. So Catherine will wrap us up and then we'll uh, continue with some more questions. Yeah, thanks. I was like adjusting my hat and I wasn't ready for the camera again, but I'm back. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. I know I always learn so much when I help out with these. And as Dan likes to tell me, when we used to go in the forest together more often, when you know the trees' names, they can become your friends. I always have to say that when I can, because I think it's really a cool way to um, approach tree ivy. Um, so thanks for joining us. You can, again, check your email for a survey and more resources um, that follow up on the information. Um, the surveys really help us to make the events even better for the future, so we really appreciate your feedback. Um, and then you can join us for more events. So March 11th, we will be doing a little virtual wildlife tracking in the winter. March 25th, traditional Abenaki sugaring and stories, which I'm super excited about. Um, and then in April, we'll talk about wildlife in the city of Burlington specifically. And then at the end of April, we'll talk about birds in the woods. So 
um, check that out on our website and register if you want to. And then you can always visit vlt.org um, to learn more about the land trust, donate, become a member, sign up for our email newsletters, anything you could want to do. I'm going to plug the Instagram page too, because why not? At Vermont Land Trust on Instagram. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the wrap up information. And um, you're free to uh, leave the meeting, leave the webinar if you want to go on with your afternoon. Um, and if you want to stay for longer, I think we'll do maybe 10-ish more minutes of Q&A. So um, we really appreciate you for joining us. And if you want to stick around for more questions, please do. And I will just hand the mic back to the foresters to answer some questions. Great. Thank you, Catherine. So yeah, let's spend another maybe 10 minutes or so with some questions. And, uh, and Caitlin, since uh, we didn't have any we didn't have a chance to give some maple specific questions to you yet. We'll let's start there. So um, <clears throat> there's a few that came in during your talk and right at the end. Um, there's a question here about um, black maple and whether uh, where it's found in its distribution in Vermont. Yeah, thanks. Black maple is cool. I actually have never seen it, but I know it's in the Champlain Valley. It's an uncommon tree. Um, to Vermont, it tends to be, it's found on uh, sweeter soils, so higher calcium, higher pH, um, but it is not not commonly um, seen. Uh, have, you, have you guys seen it out in the woods? No. Yeah, only in the Champlain Valley. <clears throat> yeah, same here. <clears throat> um, not necessarily a tree ID question, but a, a question about um, sugaring and the term monocropping and whether you have thoughts on that, Caitlin. Yeah, so I know a big concern, you know, for um, when we think of how long uh, sugar bushes have been managed to really uh, just uh, focus on one, one species, sugar maple, which, which I will add, um, you can tap red maples. People actually tap Norway maples, they tap back elders, but in Vermont, red maples and sugar maples are both, both tapped because they both have, you know, sweet, you know, on average, 2% sugar content to their sap. Um, but yeah, the, the concern is that when you start creating this monoculture, it, uh, it, you lose a lot of the other important values of our forests. And so uh, one is, uh, can make you a lot more susceptible to pests and disease. There was a study by UVM that found that having even non-sugar maple species mixed into a sugar bush um, can reduce your likelihood of um, health impacts from a lot of the, um, the pests that attack maple. And then the other issue about sort of mono, what was the term, uh, Dan, monoculture or monocropping? Yes. Yeah, so is um, there are, each of these species has a suite of um, uh, insects and uh, you know, spiders, all these uh, organisms that are either specific to that host or rely significantly on that host for some part of their life cycle. And so you're sort of losing that ability of those trees to provide that habitat for those insects that provide sort of the base of the food web. And then um, another concern, and this doesn't come to the, the maybe the species specific issue, but when you're, you know, a lot of sugar bushes, because you have to make your way through them and, um, you know, be able to access lines and keep the lines clear, um, you end up removing a lot of the understory, which is like the next forest. And that's important nesting habitat for a lot of our songbirds. So there's a lot of different things to think about, you know, when having a healthy sugar bush, the forest and parks has some great guidelines. And Audubon also has a great program called uh, Bird, Bird Friendly Maple, which um, is trying to get at some of all these other values, um, eco forest ecosystem values um, in, in delivering many things. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, Liz had also asked about tapping red maples and you, you addressed that, but she had a follow-up that I'm gonna let you and Peter split about tapping yellow birch. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, for a lot of years uh yellow birch uh and to a certain extent black birch were uh the source for wintergreen flavoring for things uh now they have synthetic um flavorings so it's not as common anymore but it definitely still happens 
And I think, you know, especially white birch up in um, Alaska, there's pretty significant tapping um, up there. Um, and there's some, there's conserved farms around here. I know um, the uh, Abbey and Trent Rollo Gateway Farm, they're tapping birch, um, yeah. producing an ice birch syrup. You have to be a little bit more careful about how you tap them because they're not as good at, at uh, sort of walling off the, any infection that gets in as a result of that tap. So you have, your taps have to be much further apart and you have to make sure that it's a good vigorous tree, otherwise you might get into trouble. Great, thank you. Um, David, a question here about how hop hornbeam bark reminds someone of shagbark hickory. Um, any tricks to tell the difference in the winter? Yeah, the big thing for me is I would look at tree size right away. Um, you know, the hop hornbeam doesn't get really that large. Like in a shag bark, it's definitely a commercial tree and gets very large. And the bark, um, you know, really young trees not coming to me, but, um, you know, the bark is very different. Just remember in the hop hornbeam, it's almost paper-like where shag bark is, um, it may look paper-like from a distance, but it's a much thicker, heavier bark. Hope that helps. Great, thank you. A couple questions on ash here that I'll try to take. Um, one was a comment from Ned that said he'd always heard, always heard that ash, the name ash came from the high amounts of wood ash that would come out of uh, fireplaces, and wood stoves. He wants to know if there's anything to that folklore. I, I don't know, but I like, I like that a lot. Um, we have to check on that. Um, and then a, a couple questions about EAB um, and whether it makes sense to uh, cut the ash tree for firewood once the blonding starts. Boy, that's a, uh, that's a simple question with a complicated answer. Um, and um, I think quickly, I would note that we encourage folks to, to think about the ash on their property before EAB arrives so that you can work with your consulting forester if you're a woodland owner, or think about safety issues of dead ashes around your home or walking trails if you have a smaller property, and plan in advance. Um, there are some very specific strategies that you, can, uh, that you can take in timber harvesting to try to propagate ash and um, kind of spread, enhance the genetic diversity of ash on the landscape. And that's part of the key here because we also had questions about um, whether we think our ash can adapt and if there's any trees left in Michigan, any ash trees left. The answer is yes. Actually, where we're finding the resistance in white ash trees, the EAB is in Michigan. So that's a real uh, spot of hope. Um, and I have to think that our trees can adapt, but it's going to be with our help. Um, they're, they're starting um, nurseries and plantations with what are called lingering ash, ash that uh, do have some resistance to, to EAB and trying to think about the beginning stages of propagating ash that might be more resistant to EAB in the future, but it's gonna be a long road. How about, um, how about back to a, about another maple question. So, there was a question, and now I'm, you guys asked so many great questions. I'm having a hard time tracking them here in the uh, question and answer box. Um, can it be hard to tell Norway maple when it's young from striped maple? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. The the bark of striped maple is um, is pretty distinctive. It does have it has these white sort of stripes to it, and you'll also striped maple. I guess when it's young, it's they're all kind of the same height. Striped maple is an understory species, so it's never going to get more than twenty to thirty feet high. Um, but the the when they're down low too, you'll also see the buds. And striped maple buds just have two. Um, two bud scales, and they kind of look like this. It's like kind of like praying hands. Um, so that's pretty uh, pretty distinctive when you, if you remember the Norway maple buds, which is kind of the beefier bud. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Peter, Emily says she sometimes sees red on paper birch bark. Any mm -hmm. idea what that would be? Red on the bark? Uh, I can... You know, the, the, the inner bark, <clears throat> what you might be seeing is if as the bark peels back, you can see underneath the, a little, little bit of the inner bark showing through, and that can be sort of 
orangey red for sure. So maybe that's what she's seeing. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> question here about um, how to tell black ash bark from elm bark since they are similar and both grow in, uh, in wet areas. That's a great question. They're both very spongy. Um, I have two quick thoughts on that. If you, if you pull apart the elm bark, they used to tell us it looked like ham and cheese because it was uh, layered with dark and light layers. So that's elm. And then, if, and then if you look up, this isn't just looking at the bark, but the ash has that opposite, opposite very stout branching structure. The elm branches are gonna be uh, much finer and alternate. David, I'm looking for another uh, another oak question for you. That's okay. But it got away from me here. Well, maybe we should um, think about wrapping it up with uh, this final question about resources. Uh, folks are asking about whether we can have the PowerPoint available uh, with the slides and whether we have recommendations on um, best on best tree ID uh, guides. So the answer to that is yes, on, on both counts, we are going to make the presentation into a power, or excuse me, a PDF, and we'll send that out uh, in a follow-up email. And that will also have a list of various resources. One really good place to go is the Our Vermont Woods webpage. Um, they have a whole page dedicated to tree ID. So that's a good place to start. And we do want to uh, give a shout out to um, the Northern Forest Atlas, which is uh, the website where we took a lot of those uh, really intricate uh, photos of the buds. Um, that's a project of Jerry Jenkins, an ecologist over there, who's really trying to document all all the um, all the life in the Northern Forest, and he has amazing photography. Uh, we'll include a link to that site uh, in the follow-up resources as well. It's well worth a look. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, we'll be back in touch with a follow-up email. And anything else to say, Catherine? No, just thanks for being here. Take the survey, please. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks. Enjoy your day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.